And now our sermon for today, as I mentioned in, my, in our prayer time, is entitled Jeconiah. Jeconiah, the prisoner king. And you can find his story in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. Jeconiah in the Bible is also known as Coniah, and he is also known as Jehoiachin. So in the next two chapters, in fact, he's known by that name Jehoiachin even more than he's known by the name Jeconiah, but it's the same person. He was the 19th king of Judah. He was overthrown by the king of Babylon, a big superpower during that time. And he was taken into captivity with his family, his court, and all other key leaders. And that's why we entitled this message, The Prisoner King. Though he was the grandson of good King Josiah, the most faithful king in the history of Judah, Jeconiah, like so many of the other kings, was not faithful to the Lord. And his unfaithfulness is the reason that he was imprisoned. His unfaithfulness was the reason that God let him be imprisoned by his enemies, but also imprisoned in his soul. And so jumping right into this scripture, I want you to notice in verse 1 of chapter 24 that Jeconiah, number 1, was imprisoned by his heritage. He was imprisoned by his heritage. The reason? Because his father, Jehoiakim, was not obedient to God. And he brought down the wrath of the Babylonian empire upon his son. Reading in verse 1, during Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invaded the land and Jehoiakim, Jeconiah's father, became his vassal, his subject, for three years. But then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelled. Then reading in verse uh, 2, the Lord sent Babylon. So look at that, the Lord sent Babylon because of Jeconiah's sin and Jehoiakim's sin, The Lord sent Babylon, Aramean and Moabite and Ammonite raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from the presence of the Lord because of the sins of Manasseh, his grandfather, all the sins he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. You remember they were practicing infant sacrifice, burning infants alive, perverse religious practices, idolatry, and God had enough and allowed Babylon to imprison the nation of Judah. In verse 6, Jehoiakim, Jeconiah's father, rested with his ancestors And Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, his son, succeeded him as king. And so Jeconiah became king under imprisonment. And then in verse 6, Jehoiakim rested with his ancestors, and Jehoiachin, his son, succeeded him as king. He was imprisoned by his heritage. But you don't have to be imprisoned by your heritage. Some of you come from a long line of horse thieves and wife beaters. But you don't have to be imprisoned by those patterns. Some of you have different different family curses in your background. Unfaithfulness, divorce, suicide in your family tree. But you don't have to be imprisoned by your heritage. Drug abuse, alcoholism. But you don't have to be imprisoned by your heritage. No matter how toxic your past has been, no matter how toxic your family tree has been, through Jesus Christ, you can be adopted into a new family, the family of faith in God. Through Jesus, you can be free. You can be free. Next, I want you to notice that Jeconiah was also imprisoned by his sin. Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, the Bible says, was 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan. And she was from Jerusalem. 
And then notice in verse 9, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. Oh, by the way, folks, if you ever sin, it's on you. It's not because of your dad or your mom or your grandfather or your grandmother or the way you were toilet trained or that your older sister looked cross-eyed at you. No, it's on you. If you sin, you don't have to be a slave to your heritage. But Jeconiah went the way of his father and continued to sin against the Lord. But no, he was imprisoned then by his own sin. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord just as his father had done. People talk about Jeconiah's imprisonment by the Babylonian Empire, but they don't realize that his real imprisonment was the prison of sin. Was the prison of sin. And it's still that way today. Romans 3.23 says it this way, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, And the wages of sin is death. All have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. Preachers, politicians, poets, school teachers, doctors, nurses, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all in the prison of sin, and it's on us. It's our fault. And there's no way out. But Jesus has the key to your prison, the prison of sin. Thirdly, I want you to notice that Jeconiah was imprisoned, of course, by his enemy. In verse 10, at that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came to the city while his officers were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, remember that's Jeconiah's other name, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, His mother, his attendants, his nobles, his officials, all surrendered to him, Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. Imprisoned by the enemy. Imprisoned by an external force that was just so great that no one in the world could overcome the power of the Babylonian empire. And he was imprisoned. Prison. Just that name means captivity. Prison. The loss of your freedom. Prison. Stealing something from you. Prison. Stealing your humanity. Prison. Stealing your manhood. Prison. Stealing your womanhood. But I can tell you story after story. Right here in South Main Baptist Church. Of people meeting Jesus. And being free. Free from the prison of their minds. Free from the prison of sin. And even free from the physical prison as in our re-entry programs as people get out of jail. Families are restored. People working jobs. People that are clean from drugs and alcohol. Serving the Lord. Leading their families. People meeting Jesus and being free. You've heard the stories as well. You know, you've heard Cedric a couple, of, uh, uh, a couple of months ago that gave his testimony here in church. Two years free from drug and alcohol. We met him in jail, baptized him in the jail. He's now on the staff at Pathway House, building his life again, free in Jesus. Story after story, the little kid in Good News Club that prayed for his dad to be saved. And and then our Good News Club leaders, Bob Thomas in particular, said, well, let's look him up and let's share Christ with him in, in prison and led him to the Lord. And then the next week he brought a friend and led that friend to the Lord. And that started our jail ministry. We baptized 60 people out of our out of our jail ministry. People who are no longer in prison because of Jesus Christ. So whatever external superpower you're facing, whatever superpower is threatening you, besieging you, threatening to take your freedom, whether it's health or addiction or sin or or, 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 or just financial catastrophe, you can overcome. And the beginning step is Jesus Christ. Jeconiah was imprisoned by his enemy. 
And then next, Jeconiah was imprisoned by his own will. By his own will. Look at 2 Kings 25. And you see this story of Jeconiah, Jehoiakim, is, uh, is uh, revisited. It says, in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the year that Awel Marduk became the king of Babylon, he released Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, from prison. He did this on the 27th day of the 12th month. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon because they had, they, had they, they had just swept over kingdom after kingdom. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes for the rest of his life, ate at the king's table. Day by day, the king gave Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as as he lived. You might think that's a happily ever after story, but actually it's tragic. Because the bottom line, Jehoiachin totally surrendered to the Babylonians. He sued for peace with the enemy. He totally adopted the sinful, pagan, perverse lifestyle of the Babylonians. The infant sacrifice, the oppression of women... The temple prostitution. He adopted it all. He was still a prisoner, but he was a prisoner willingly, in his own will, in his own mind, suing for peace with the enemy, the godless Babylonians. He was released from his cage. He put aside his prison clothes, but it was all play acting. He was still a vassal. He was still a slave. He was still a prisoner. And some of you are like this today. You don't want to be free. You've sued for peace with the enemy, the devil. You've settled for a mediocre spiritual lifestyle. You enjoy your enslavement to sin. You have no aspiration to a higher, more noble life. And in doing so, you may never know true victory. You may be lost for all eternity unless you turn to Jesus Christ to be free. The saddest thing in the world to me as a pastor is not our prison inmates who are lost in their prison, their sin, their, their, their jail sentence, their addiction, their alcoholism. Oh no, the saddest thing to me are lost people that are all dressed up. They're not wearing prison clothes. They don't have any addictions. They have a family that's relatively doing well. And they think they've got it all, a job, the house, the home. They're lost without Jesus. Prisoners. Enslaved. Desperately lost at least our inmates knew they were lost. Some, it's just too good to leave. To leave that comfort zone. To leave that enslavement to sin. To live a more noble life of freedom in Jesus. Imprisoned. Imprisoned by your own will. Some of you are imprisoned by worry. By worry. What's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to our world? What's going to happen to our nation? The persecuted church in Nigeria, though, has it a lot worse than us. Some of them are dying today for their faith. The believers in Afghanistan who know their life is about to end, they have it worse than us. Those in Haiti who are victims of political strife and the earthquake and the hurricane all in one, they know strife and we can just look at the prayer list in our church person after person physical illness family strife financial ruin but some of you are imprisoned by worry but jesus said it's useless for you to be worried god is going to take care of you look at the lilies of the field 
They toil not, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed as one of these. Look at the sparrows. They don't toil, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Imprisoned by worry. Some of you are imprisoned by ungodly attitudes. You can't control your anger or rage. Some of you can't hold your tongue. You've just got foot-in-mouth disease. Some of you are controlled by bitterness or unforgiveness. Ungodly attitudes imprisoning you. Others may be imprisoned by strongholds of sin, pornography, unfaithfulness, physical addictions, smoking, alcoholism, or maybe just laziness or just an undisciplined health habits. Sometimes, sometimes I, don't, I think I don't have any problem that an ice cream sundae can't solve. Imprisoned by attitudes, unhealthy attitudes, unhealthy habits, worry, strife. And then others of you might be imprisoned by other enemies. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Bible names the three main enemies of the Christian, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world tempts us with all of the alternatives to sin, a thousand ways to do wrong, but only one way to do right, Jesus Christ. The alternatives to sin. The flesh can, can imprison you with the insatiable appetite for sin. Wanting to do our own will, wanting to go our own way, wanting to fulfill our own desires without a regard for God. The world, the alternatives to sin, the flesh, the appetite for sin. And then the devil, of course, is always at work trying to tempt you with the attitude to sin. The attitude to sin. No one will ever find out. Just this once. No one will ever know. You're really missing some spice in life. You're really missing something some fulfillment. You're really missing something by not engaging in that sin. The world, the alternative to sin, the flesh, the appetites for sin, the devil, the attitude to sin. Imprisoned. I bet all of us can, can think of an area of our life that, that is threatening to, to, to capture us. Some try to fight their way out of prison. Never work. You can't be saved by your own human effort, by your own human works. The bars are too strong. The lock is too strong. And ironically, the only real way to be free is to surrender. To surrender to God. He can set you free. He can unlock that prison door. Only by receiving Jesus can you truly be set free from the enslavement of sin. Bob Dylan once wrote a song entitled, You've Got to Serve Somebody. Bob Dylan's song, You've Got to Serve Somebody. And here are some of the lyrics. It goes like this. You may be an ambassador to England or to France. You may like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may even be the heavyweight champion of the world. Or you may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you've got to serve somebody. Yes, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord. But you've got to serve somebody. You may be a businessman or some high degree thief. They may call you doctor or they may call you chief. You may be rich or poor. You may be blind or lame. You may be living in another country under another name. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, you've got to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil. Or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. Who will you serve today? 
Joshua spoke to the children of Israel and he gave them a challenge. He said this, choose you this day whom you will serve. And he said this, he said, whether it's the God of the surrounding nations or whether it's the true God of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. But then he said this, but as for me and my house, what did he say? We'll serve the Lord. We'll serve the Lord. And that's how you can truly be free. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, while we are all here uh, in prayer, each person alone with God, I want to serve my Creator. I want to serve the Lord. I want to serve the Lord who made me. The Lord who loved me. The Lord who gives me my very next breath, the Lord who gives me my very next heartbeat, the one who is our Father who art in heaven. I want to serve the Lord. And you can serve the Lord today. You can be released from whatever prison you're in. Jesus has the key. If you'll receive him, If you trust him, he will set you free. I was imprisoned under the sentence of death. But before the sentence could be carried out, a great act of mercy occurred. The prison door flung open. Jesus took my place. And I was forgiven and free. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus and walk into freedom with Him. And you do that by receiving Christ. Pray this prayer with me if you need Jesus. Lord Jesus, I open the door of my life and I welcome you to come in. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Free me from my prisons. Make me the kind of person that you want me to be. I want to be free in you. Thank you for giving your blood on the cross to pay for my sins. To pay the fine, the penalty that I owed for my sins. And all you want me to do is just receive you and your forgiveness as a free gift. So, Lord, the best, the best way I know how, I reach out and say yes to you, your plan. I receive your gift. I give all of myself to all that I know of you, Lord. I want to be free. I want to be free. Thank you now, by faith for saving me and for giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.